once again to our ongoing series on the glories of our beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. Namo Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namane, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Nivishesha Shunyavadi Pashtata Deshatarne. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. So, so today I would like to um, continue with the theme of um, wandering in Vrindavan. Not only because um, Srila Prabhupada sanctioned it, as we discussed in another lecture, but because um, our Lord Krishna spends much of his own time wandering around Braj. And where is that stated? Well, in the song Jai Radha Madhava, which um, every devotee sings before the um, Srimad Bhagavatam class or Bhagavad Gita class. And that um, very famous song is actually written by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And the, the official name of the song is actually Sri Krishna Vim Shotara Shatanama. And it's found in um, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur's book called Gita Vali. And um, it's, it's song number four. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Jana Balaba Girivari Dari Shodanandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamunatira Vanachari Krishna is the lover of Radha. He displays many amorous pastimes in the groves of Vrindavan. He is the lover of the cowherd maidens in Braj and the holder of the great hill named Govardhan. He is the beloved son of Mother Yashoda, the delighter of the inhabitants of Braj, and he wanders, and he wanders in the forest along the banks of the river Jamuna. So therein we hear Yamuna Tira Vanachari. Krishna wanders in the forest along the banks of the river Jamuna. Now in um, Allahabad and Gorakhpur, here in India, Srila Prabhupada um, fell into trance after singing the first two, two lines of the song. And after coming back to external consciousness in Gorakhpur, he said, quote, now just chant Hare Krishna, unquote. <laughs> and Prabhupada said that um, this song is, quote, a picture of Vrindavan. Everything is there. Srimati Radharani, Vrindavan, Govardhan, Yashoda, and all the cowherd boys. So again, in the song, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur emphatically declares that Krishna wanders, Vanachari, he wanders in the forest of Vrindavan along the banks of the Jumuna River. So today, we'll wander with him <laughs> through Shabda Brahma, the transcendental sound. So in our last lecture, we passed through um, the forest of Gauravana, now, nearby to Gauravana is the forest called uh, Atalavana, Atalavana. And just to the west of Atalavana is a very, very special forest that I would like to um, lecture on today. You'll be very happy he to hear the name of this forest. <laughs> this forest is called Radhavan, Radhavana. And this forest of Radhavan runs uh, along a good portion of the Jamuna River. And it goes without saying that Radhavan is a favorite place of Srimati Radharani and her girlfriends. Our beloved Srila Prabodhananda Saraswati has written an exquisitely beautiful and very charming verse about this particular forest, Radhavan. I've been trying to, uh, to memorize it. I haven't got it down yet, but um, the Sanskrit's very beautiful and the verse just touches the heart. Radhakara Vaichita Palava Valarike. Radha Padanka Vilashan Madura Stalike. Radha Yasho uh, Mukara Mata Kavaka Like. Radha Vihara Vipine Ramatam Manome. Quote I pray that my heart may always find happiness and Shimati Radhika's pastime forest, where the creepers bear flowers that are picked by her own hands, where many charming places bear her footprints and birds passionately sing her glories. 
<laughs> I'm going to recite that again. I pray that my heart may always find happiness in Srimati Radhika's pastime forest, where the creepers bear flowers that are picked by her own hands, where many charming places bear her footprints and birds passionately sing her glories. This is from Radharasa Sudhaniti, verse number 14. And as one might imagine, um, imagine, many wonderful pastimes take place daily in the forest of Radhavan. Um, for example, after bathing in the Jamuna, gopis like Lalita and Vishaka comb and braid Shirada's hair there and decorate her with the fragrant flowers that grow in abundance in Radhavan. And um, I read that the Acharyas say that Radhavan is similar to Radhakund in many ways and is as dear to Radharani as Radhakund is to her. And because Radhavan is dear to her, the forest is also very dear to Krishna. And that we can appreciate in a beautiful pastime that I came across in Radhavan. <coughs> One time, anticipating where Shimati Radharani would bathe in the Jamuna, in the Radhavan forest, Krishna hid himself within a, quote, cluster of blue lotus flowers in the river. You know how the flowers float in the river, the lotus flowers. So he hid himself in a cluster of blue lotus flowers in the river and waited until um, Radharani and her friends arrived at a nearby uh, bathing ghat. So soon, Shirada and the gopis arrived. They um, entered the water. It's described joking and splashing and, of course, talking about Krishna. <laughs> and, um, but when, when um, Shirada strayed into deeper water, she came very close to that cluster of blue lotuses where Krishna was hiding. And um, soon she got the scare of her life. She was swimming peacefully, um, again with her mind absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. When the Acharya say, suddenly this cluster of blue lotuses in front of her exploded with a roar and completely covered her with water, um, lotus leaves, and foam. So Shimati Radharani was very startled and she thought, what is this, a demon, a crocodile, or what? And then she screamed for help. But as soon as things calmed down, um, she saw just a few meters away, Krishna floating in the water, smiling and laughing on the joke he just played in her. But the Acharyas say that, quote, for Sri Radha, this was no laughing matter. And so her fear quickly turned into mana or anger. And she immediately turned her back on Krishna, waded out of the water, and ran into the forest, followed by her equally upset uh, girlfriends. So Krishna was left alone, uh, standing a shoulder deep in the Jamuna, and very disappointed that Shirada had taken the joke so personally. So he waded back to the shore, waded through the water, sat down on the river bank, uh, completely dejected, wondering how he could pacify Shirada's anger. Now we often hear um, in our Bhakti Shastras how Radha's anger <laughs> is never easy to appease. Krishna always has a hard time. Of course, we should be careful not to think that her anger is something uh, material or something mundane. It's transcendental and has its purpose. And this is very nicely described in Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Leela, chapter 14, verse 197. Shtanada ri garahane, pitav apisam baramat, pahi koro vya titavat, proktam kutamatim budai. Quote, describing Radha, when the border of her sari and the cloth veiling her face are caught by Krishna, she externally appears offended and very angry, but within her heart, she is very happy. Learned scholars call this attitude kuta mita, kuta mita. Externally, she's angry, 
but inside her heart she's very happy. <laughs> so it's a different type of anger than we may think in this world. She's angry, yes, she's, she's angry, but that anger facilitates um, Radha and Krishna's attachment for each other, so it's very favorable. And I was reading the other night that um, uh, when Shirada is experiencing, we say in Sans Sanskrit, this mana, mana, anger towards Krishna, um, she often goes to her room uh, to pout, either in Varshana or in Yavat, because we know as time went on, she lived in various places. So when she's angry, very often she goes to her room and she closes the door and pouts. So the scriptures describe that often Krishna manages to actually get into Varshana, to get into Yavar, and he'll go to her room and he'll knock on the door. The Charyas say that Radharani always refuses to speak to him. So he always tries to plead you know, through the door. And one time in Yavat, as Krishna was trying to appeal through the door to Sri Radha, one of her sakis, one of her girlfriends who was attending to her, stormed out very angrily from the room. And she said to Krishna, quote, Krishna, Sri Radha is completely drenched in the brilliant red color of love, exactly like a gunja seed. Oh, expert word juggler Krishna, her love is not like your love, which is exactly like the tiny red color on the parrot's beak. I'll try to analyze that a little bit. So the Saki is comparing love to the color of red in this analogy. And she's saying that Radharani's love for Krishna is full, like the prominent red color on a gunja seed. You see in Vrindavan these little seeds, they make little necklaces sometimes, especially for the Govardhan Shilas. Um, so if, if you look on that seed, the special seeds in Vrindavan, they're um, red, black, and white, but red's the predominant color. So the Saki is saying that Radha's um, love for Krishna is full, like the prominent red color on a gunja seed, whereas Krishna's love for Radha, it's, it's minimal. It's like the touch of red on a, on, a, on a parrot's beak. Here in India, we have lots of those green parrots in Braj. They're flying everywhere taking messages. And if you look, there's a little red dot on the side, it's both sides of the parrot's beak. So she's comparing the love like that. A again, Shirada is completely drenched in the brilliant red color of love, exactly like a gunja seed. Oh, expert word jugular Krishna, her love is not like your love, which is exactly like the red tiny dot uh, on a parrot's beak. So Krishna, back to this particular pastime where he's joked with her in the river and she's gone into the forest. So Krishna's back on the, he's on the river bank and he, he's absorbed in thought how to pacify Shirada's mana or anger in this particular pastime. Can't figure out how to do it. It's not easy. When it's described suddenly, Srimati Vrindadevi, happens to walk by. Well, not happens, because she plans all these pastimes with Purnamasi. She happens to walk by with a number of her helpers who are carrying a variety of clothes and ornaments on their way to a forest storehouse. We've discussed many times how Vrinda Devi keeps these forest uh, storehouses in different parts of Vrindavan with different paraphernalia for the devotees to use in the service of Radha and Krishna in that particular part of the forest. So here Vrinda's going with her helpers and they've got all these items and passes by Krishna and the acharyas say, Krishna smiled and thought, this must be the hand of fate. So approaching Vrinda Dev, he described his predicament. You know, I angered her with this little joke in the river and now she's in the forest pouting with her friends and how do I appease her? So he said to Rinda Devi, Oh Devi, please help me to regain Radha's favor. So Rinda Devi smiled and quickly she came up with a solution. And what was that? Well, with the clothes and the ornaments her servants were carrying, she and her helpers dressed Krishna up 
as a beautiful young girl, as a gopi, a tactic we know that Krishna often employs trying to get close to Radha to say he's sorry. So satisfied with this disguise, when they finished, Vrindadevi said, Krishna, you know what to do now. So Krishna, what did he do? Um, he followed the gopis' footprints deep into the Radhavan forest, right up to the entrance of a grove where Radharani was surrounded by her girlfriends and she was complaining to her girlfriends about Krishna's trick in the Jamuna. And suddenly Radharani looks up and she sees this new uh, gopi standing at the entrance to this, um, this kunj. But she couldn't recognize it was Krishna. And although Krishna was disguised, his, his um, sweetness and beauty enchanted Srimati Radharani. Actually, the text says, completely bewildered her mind. So Radharani felt a, a certain... Um, a surge of affection for this new uh, dark complexion girl and invited her in. Radharani said to this new gopi, O moon-faced one, who are you? You are so sweet and beautiful. Please become my very dear friend. <laughs> oh, for that day when Radharani says, please become my very dear friend. <clears throat> So as Krishna, disguised as the, the gopi, entered the grove, Radharani noticed um, his or her as a hesitation. And she said, Oh friend, you seem to be trembling. Is it with fear? I wonder, is this because you know that Krishna lays in wait for you somewhere in the Vrindavan forest? So then Radha reached out and took hold of that gopi's wrist, Krishna's wrist. And as soon as she did so, Shastra says, quote, she felt exhilarated, words stuck in her throat, and her limbs went stiff. Now as soon as that happened, all of her girlfriends attending to her understood who this new gopi actually was. And they all smiled in approval. How did they know? Because these are symptoms that Srimati Radharani often feels or exhibits in Krishna's presence. So these girls are clued in. So in this particular instant, they were very pleased because ultimately the seva of these um, gopis is to actually unite Radha and Krishna. That's their greatest pleasure. So they all smiled in approval. And Radharani, when she saw her girlfriend's favorable reactions, she also smiled. And she had no choice but to give up her anger. And she spent the rest, rest of the afternoon in Krishna's blissful association. <laughs> so this, of course, is... I, I was reading this particular um, chapter, and uh, there are many pastimes there. So they're in the Radhavan forest. This is just one. Actually, the one Acharya says, and I quote, it's very beautiful, no one um, can count how many pastimes Radha and Krishna enjoy in the forest of Radhavan. Every pastime is novel, even if it happens hundreds of times. And devotees derive ever-expanding bliss hearing about them, which is so true. Now, our acharyas also point out that whenever Krishna tries to pacify Radharani's um, mana or anger, ultimately, he's almost always successful. And they give a very, um, uh, an especially sweet example of that. And that is that um, one time, Nanda Maharaj invited King Bishamanu and all the residents of Varshana to come to Nandagram to discuss um, some upcoming festivities. Now that day, for some reason, Radharani was especially angry with Krishna. I think I was reading that she'd seen him with another gopi the day before, so she was angry. Nevertheless, she decided to also come along. And at that particular meeting, you know, arranged by 
Nanda Maharaj. Um, Krishna was sitting on uh, one side of the meeting and Radharani was sitting not far away on the other side of the meeting. So as the discussions were going on, Krishna kept trying to get, you know, attract the attention of Radha. <laughs> but she wouldn't have anything to do with him. Now at one point, the morning sun came shining um, through the window. And taking advantage of this, Krishna found a very unique and very sweet way to appease Bhadravani's anger. It's described even in front of all the elders. And this is very nicely described in Rupa Goswami's Padyavali, how he did this. It's verse uh, 241, as follows. <clears throat> In order to appease Sri Radha, Krishna placed the shadow of his head at her feet, taking advantage of that sunshine. Krishna placed the shadow of his head at her feet. Then she put the shadow of both her palms on the shadow of the head of Krishna. In this way, both of them seated in front of their seniors, pacified each other and relieved their sulkiness. May this act of conciliation by Krishna and the loving forgiveness by Shirada be victorious in all the worlds. Wow. The sunshine's coming in, so creating shadows at the same time. So through their shadows, they um, were able to come to terms, give up their, their sulkiness. <laughs> May this act of conciliation by Krishna and the loving forgiveness by Shirada be victorious in all the worlds. Thank you, Sri Rupa Goswami. So we'll continue wandering. You're not tired yet, are you? Wandering. <laughs> and next, um, uh, it's a couple kilometers further, we come to a, a very beautiful and especially fragrant forest. You'll understand by hearing the name. Chamelivan. Chamelivan. Chamelivan got its name because of the chameli flowers, or we know them as jasmine flowers that bloom there. And many of you know jasmine flowers are, the aroma is overwhelming. And the beautiful aroma of the jasmine flowers at chameli Van, it, it's well known amongst Brajabasis, particularly for the fact that the jasmine flowers there, they blossom all day and all night irregardless of what season it is. You know, there's six seasons present at all times in Sri Vrindavan Dham. We mentioned this earlier, another lecture. And Radha and Krishna, they enjoy the particular characteristics of different seasons, even in one day, passing through all the six seasons. Now, in all those seasons, whenever they come to Chamelivan, the flowers are always uh, blooming. They're in blossom, and day and night as well. <laughs> and so it's described, Krishna really likes to meet Radharani there, whenever possible. Now going a little bit deeper into this particular forest, Chamelevon, in the uh, far uh, southern corner of Chamelevon, there's a place called Vanachari. Vanachari, obviously gets his, its name from the fact that Krishna likes to wander there. We, are, we heard earlier from Sita Bhaktiv Thakur, he likes to wander along the shores of the Jamuna and di different forests. This is, he really likes to wander there in this Chamelevan, particular in, the, in this particular place called Manachari. And um, while doing three things, what is Krishna doing when, he, when he's wandering? Maybe someday someone will ask you that question. <laughs> when Krishna's wandering, what is he doing? So Rupa Goswami is so kind, he reveals to us what the Lord does when he wanders. He does three things. He herds his cows, he plays with his friends, and he strolls with Radha. Rajajana Ranjana Jumuna Tira Vanachari. So the scriptures say that, quote, the gopis like to bring Radha and Krishna to Vanachari 
seats him on a crystal throne within this general chameli forest or grove. And then what? And then decorate them with a variety of ornaments, all fashioned from flowers, all kinds of flowers. Now in his Radha Krishna Gonadesha Dipika, Sri Rupa Goswami states that the divine couple's ornaments are generally made of uh, gold, but set with different uh, precious stones in the gold, you know, rubies, diamonds, sapphires. But sometimes these ornaments can be fashioned only from flowers. And what type of ornaments or what type of particular um, things that Krishna, Radha and Krishna may wear that can be fashioned from flowers? He, he describes this in verse 138, what you can make from flower ornaments. And I'll just quote the verse as it is. Quote, the flower ornaments of the divine couple, the flower ornaments of the divine couple are flower crowns, flowers in the hair, flower earrings, flowers decorating the forehead, flower necklaces, flower armlets, flower sashes around the waist, flower, flower bracelets, flower anklets, flower bodices, and many other kinds of flower ornaments. And then Rupa Goswami concludes, just as these ornaments may be fashioned from precious jewels, gold, or other materials, in the same way they can be made of flowers. And that's exactly what happens. <laughs> this is a pastime place for flower ornaments um, in, in Vanachari, for Radha and Krishna. <clears throat> and because it's considered um, one of the 64 devotional arts mentioned in uh, Bhakti Rasa and Rita Sindhu and summarized by Srila Prabhupada, Nectar of Devotion, because it's one of the devotional arts which are so um, important in serving the divine couple, Rupa Goswami goes into even greater detail in verse 141. And he, it's a list, he gives a list of um, exactly what are these flower ornaments and how they're made. How many flowers and how you arrange them and what colors. It's really beautiful. I read it for like 45 minutes. But I'll just give you a few examples because um, you know, time is of essence. Here's some examples that he gives. Quote, the flower crowns known as Pushpapara are the best of all and they're more pleasing than even the best jeweled crowns called Ratnapara. Lalita Devi learned how to make these Pushpapara flower crowns directly from Srimati Radharani. These Pushpapara crowns are made with flowers and flower buds of five different colors and placed in five points on the crown. This crown is expressly used to decorate Vrindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani. Um, skilled craftsmen say there are, there are five kinds of earrings. They are known by the names uh, Tadanka, Pushpi, Karnika, and Karna Vashtana. Those are the five kinds of earrings. When an earring is fashioned from flowers in order to resemble a certain object, that earring is called kundala. There are many different kinds of kundala earrings. Those flowers may be arranged to resemble a peacock, a shark, a lotus, a half moon, and many other things. In other words, you Radha and Krishna wearing earrings that look like a peacock or a shark or a lotus, half moon, but all made from flowers, not jewels. We continue. A garland of flowers placed on the upper forehead along the hairline is called lalatika. Lalatika. Such a garland should have flowers of two colors, red in the middle of the garland and the other uh, color flowers on either side. A sash, meaning around the waist, made of flowers should be done with five different colors, artistically strung together in a gently waving pattern. And Rupa Goswami calls this a kanchi. Anklets made of different flower buds are called 
kataka. These are of many varieties. Hare Krishna. <laughs> I'm sure you like to... <laughs> it takes 45 minutes just to go on in here, but oh, so satisfying. <clears throat> and Rupa Goswami goes on to write that not only that these flowers can be used in this devotional art of decorating for these small objects like earrings and anklets and bracelets, he said, but uh, this devotional art of flowers, using flowers, you, can, uh, you should also make umbrellas for Radha and Krishna, couches out of flowers, awnings out of flowers, and whole cottages out of flowers. I know in our ISKCON movement on special days like Radhastami, the Radha and Krishna get a flower outfit. But imagine, ma imagine making a whole cottage flowers. Um, the other day I mentioned um, how Prabhupada said one time that flowers are the only opulence left in Kali Yuga. <laughs> so again, this art of making flower decorations is listed as one of the 64 devotional arts. And it should be of interest to us as aspiring devotees. I mean, ultimately, at some point, we should be well versed in these arts in order to properly serve Radha and Krishna. On a morning walk um, in New Delhi, India, on August 31st, 1976, Sri Prabhupada, you could say, encouraged us in this way. And I'm quoting him on that walk. Just like Shimati Radharani, he said, she was trained up in 64 arts. Do you think to captivate Krishna is an easy thing? How much qualified she must have been so that Lord Krishna was attracted. I'll recite that again. Just like Srimati Radharani, she was trained up in 64 arts. Do you think to captivate Krishna is an easy thing? How much qualified she must have been so that Lord Krishna was attracted. So we're all, we all want to attract, by Radharani's grace, we all want to attract Krishna. That's what we're trying to do when we chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. My dear Lord, my dear energy of the Lord, Srimati Radharani, please engage me in your service. Through our chanting, we're trying to attract the Lord. And we will when that chanting becomes Shudanam, when it becomes the pure name. And so in that way, we, through the various devotional arts, Someday we can attract Krishna. And of, of course, it's mentioned, you know, that Prabhupada said that Radharani was trained up in these 64 arts. <laughs> and um, the, that she perfected them, that we know from Brahma Samhita. Of course, she, she was trained, but of course, that's the pastime. She's eternal in her her devotional service, her Radha Bhav, her pure love for Krishna is also eternal. But, and th but that she has, that sh she's perfect in that art is nicely described in Brahma Samhita. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, residing in his own realm, Goloka, with Radha, who resembles his own spiritual figure. She, the embodiment of the ecstatic potency, possessed of the 64 artistic activities, in the company of her confidants, sakis, embodiments of the extensions of her bodily form, permeated and vitalized by his ever blissful spiritual rasa. So there it's mentioned that she possesses these 64 artistic activities. And when we read Nectar Devotion, we know they begin with singing, playing musical instruments, dancing, theatrics, painting, applying cosmetics. And they exist in their perfect, complete and perfect forms in Goloka Vrindavan. And to be able to enter into that transcendental mode, we have to know them. And as we advance in Krishna consciousness at some stage, we can uh, look forward to being trained in these 64 arts. And Raghunath Das Goswami sets an example for us in his Stavavali to show us 
that we have to pray to these residents of Vrindavan <laughs> to train us up. <laughs> he prays in Stavavali, quote, I pray that Vishaka, whose voice is sweeter than the cuckoos, may teach me the art of beautiful singing. So we look forward to that day. We have to qualify ourselves, but won't it be nice to be trained in that way? For the time being, you know, yes, we're beginners for all practical purposes. And what is our work now? Well, at our stage, Bacho Vegam, Manasakrota Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Upashta Vegam, according to Rupa Goswami's instructions to us, Upadesha Amrita, we're learning to control our mind and control our senses by engaging them in Krishna's service. Maybe we're at step one, <laughs> but that's okay. Confucius, he was famous for saying, the longest journey begins with the first step. So we have to be honest where we're at, but we know it is the goal and we look forward to that day. Yeah, we still have a lot of progress to make. I remember the first time I ever saw Sridhar Vallabha. Um, it was 1971 when he was arriving at the um, Detroit Michigan Airport in America. For many of us, it was the first time seeing Sridhar Vallabha. You know, the plane landed and Prabhupada came down the Tamarack and we were waiting inside the airport and we'd actually, we'd actually brought a Vyasa son in. In those days, you could do things like that. And we had the Vyasa son, you know, right where Prabhupada and all the passengers were coming in. Prabhupada sat down. We were about at least 100 devotees. <laughs> we all sat around the Vyasa son. There wasn't even a microphone. I remember all the passengers, they were also around looking at Prabhupada because he was so effulgent. So Prabhupada gave a short darshan there, and I was fortunate enough to be sitting right up front near to Prabhupada. And w at one point, Prabhupada leaned over from his Vyasa son, and he said very slowly with great emphasis, my dear boys and girls, please, please believe me when I say you are not these bodies. So he was pleading with us. Why? Because it's not easy to become free from the bodily concept of life. I, me, and mine. So we have a ways to go. But rest assured, as it's described in the progressive path of devotional service, one day a resident of Vrindavan, Prabhupada, will train us in these 64 arts of devotional service. So it's good to hear about him. What's waiting for us? <laughs> I often say, isn't it? Re you know, repeating that, what they say in modern society, trust no future, however bright. That's true. But you can trust our future in Krishna consciousness. We know what's away. We don't have to speculate. We read the Shastras. Ado shvada tata sautu bhanga. Ado shvada tata sautu sangha. Bhajana kriya anarta nirviti syat. And then comes all the wonderful spiritual qualities. So, Let's keep advancing. <laughs> so uh, we can wander a little further. Um, I'll, I can take you to two more places, um, a little further on than Chamelevan. Maybe if I look at the map, it's more like one and a half kilometers. There's two villages um, a little further up the Jamuna River, and we will visit them. And these are the villages of Tilaka Gadi and Mani Gadi. I'd never heard of them before, but I'm very, fa I'm very happy that we, we've discovered them. And I looked on the map, and they're there, the Vrindavan map. And both of these um, villages are connected to the history of um, a very empowered saint, Vaishnava saint. He, he was a Babaji, a renunciate. Um, his name's not mentioned. Perhaps out of humility, he didn't allow anyone to write his name or mention him by name. But um, he lived in this particular area we're going to describe and uh, where well, these two villages came about. And um, he was doing his bhajan. And during this time, the uh, local villagers those 
we were there, they, well, actually, they settled in that area. And one reason was because the, the Babaji was there. He was like their local saint and their representative of Krishna. So the, a village developed. And during his time amongst them, he impressed upon the villagers the importance of the daily chanting of Krishna's holy names through the, prop the process of Japa Mala. He got, basically got them all chanting on Japa beats, the whole village, as time went on, as well as decorating their bodies with Gaudiya Vaishnav Tilak. Gaudiya Vaishnav Tilak. Tilak on the forehead and the 12 parts of the body. And in fact, eventually, the entire village, everyone was getting up every morning and chanting a fixed number of rounds on their beads, as well as decorating their bodies with Gopichandan every day. So eventually, people started, you know, looking at these Vaishnavas, Vaishnavis, because everyone in, in the village was very distinct, especially because of their tilak which is described, uh, broadcasted that they were the property of Krishna. That's how the scripture described it. People saw, oh, they're wearing all this Gaudiya Vaishnav Tilak. They're the property of Krishna. So that village became known as Tilaka Gadi. <laughs> People formed, you know, they're there, they're on the sadhu, and time goes on, years go on, they're all chanting japa, very careful to properly place the Tilak every day. So the village took on the name Tilaka Gadi. And I did a little investigation. That village still exists in Vrindavan. It's about an hour, I guess an hour and a half drive from Vrindavan itself. And the practices that this Babaji introduced endure in that village to the present day. Practically everyone in that village chants japa and they religiously and proudly wear very distinctive you know big Gaudiya Vaishnav Tilak not just on the forehead <laughs> but the whole body <laughs> Hare Krishna so when we do our um, our next Kartik Parikama we'll go there and we'll chant japa with us villagers Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastakoi, Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi. So one day, uh, as the Babaji and, and some of his followers were um, walking along the, the Jumuna River, because actually we're taking you along the Jumuna River, this whole class. We're walking along the banks of the Jumuna River, chanting Hare Krishna <laughs> on their beads. It's described a brilliant, shining object amongst the stones uh, on the riverside caught the Babaji's eye. So he bent down and he picked up, um, how could you say, a fist-sized gem. It, it's described, which shimmered with an unearthly luster. In my mind, I was trying to think, what does that look like? It's shimmering, which means it's like this, shimmering with an unearthly luster. It's also described, it felt very pleasing to the touch. Now some of the Babaji's followers, they said, oh, it's a diamond, it's a diamond. And others were saying, no, it's a precious gem that's fallen from Shvarga Loka. But Babaji, he he was playing with it like a ball. He was tossing this jewel, you could say, up in the air. He caught it again. He looked at every, everyone. He said, this is a Chintamani Mani. Mani means like it's a jewel or stone. A stone, uh, uh, Chintamani Mani. What do we call that? We call those touchstones, right? A touchstone. <laughs> and he says, this uh, Chintamani Mani, it's not a diamond. It's not fallen from Shvarga Loka. It comes from Goloka Vrindavan. Chintamani. Because what is Vrindavan made of? Chintamani pakata sarama sukopa viksha laksha vritesha shudabira bepaliandam 
the spiritual, words spiritual world is made of these Chintamani stones. They're self-effulgent, they're transcendental. <laughs> so hearing how this special touchstone, you could say, had come from um, the spiritual world, his followers imagined the priceless things that this gem could create. So then to the amazement of everyone present, that Babaji threw that precious gem right into the middle of the Jamuna River. As he said, great wealth is of value in the hands of those empowered to use it in Krishna's service, but an obstacle on the path of devotional service for ordinary souls like me. Better we just chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Don't worry. Nice instruction. Great wealth is of value in the hands of those empowered to use it in Krishna's service, just like Sridhar Bhavad. He came to America with nothing but a few rupees. But he had full faith in the chanting of Hare Krishna and the instructions of his spiritual master. So as a qualified representative of the Lord, most qualified, Krishna gave Prabhupada unlimited wealth. Great wealth is of value in the hands of those empowered to use it in Krishna's service. With that wealth, Prabhupada spared Krishna consciousness all over this world. But those not as advanced, we also have to use wealth in the service of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to continue the Sankirtan movement. We should be a little careful. It can be, if not used pro properly, an obstacle on the path of devotional service. So we have to be careful to keep the movement going. So we have to use, utilize everything in Krishna's service, yukta vairagya. And how do we remain, remain detached from that wealth? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. Just like the Babaji said, we realize that real wealth is there uh, in the chanting of Hare Krishna because that will eventually give us everything that we need, which is love for Hari, Guru, and Vaishnava. So where that particular pastime took place, people began settling there as well. And um, in time, that village also took on a name, Mani Gadi, like Tilak Gadi, because everyone was known for their Tilak, this village, not far from Tilagadi, it became Manigadi, that the village of that, that precious gem. People remember that pastime. So of course, this particular pastime at Manigadi, it reminds us of a similar pastime where Sanatana Goswami um, had a touchstone and he, he gave it to a young Brahmin boy. And um, we know that eventually that Brahmin boy, in again in favor of pure devotional service to the Lord, he took that Chintamani stone and he threw it into the, a lake actually. That pastime we discussed many months ago. Actually that particular touchstone that um, that Brahmin boy had, he threw it into the um, Kusham Shurovra Lake, Govardhan Hill. <laughs> and I heard that, you know, of course, Someone may want to find that touchdown, but I read in the 1930s the um, British government, who thought they owned India at that time, they were ruling India. They um, had they did a different surveys of the of the land as they would do, and they tried to um, determine the depth of Kusham Shurovra with whatever instruments they had at that time. They couldn't find the bottom of course, I'm sure, over a lake. I mean, in the 30s, they had, you know, some, they, they had ways of knowing how deep an ocean was, or a river, or a lake. They could not find the bottom of Kushim Shurovra. So if anyone's thinking, I'm going to find that <laughs> touchstone that, you know, the, the boy threw away in this pastime with Sanatana Goswami, <laughs> good luck. And no need to. Just Janari Krishna. So this, these 
special gem-like stones. They have, you could say, uh, an imaginary concept of them, even in Western literature. I was reading in, in Greek history, they have a similar stone. They, they also called it a philosopher's stone, for want of some better words. And the Greeks described it at this stone that um, it could turn metals such as uh, basic metals uh, in, into gold or silver. And um, it, it, the Greeks also said that such a stone um, could um, uh, make or create uh, perpetually burning lamps, that such a stone could um, turn uh, common crystals into, into diamonds, if you had such a philosopher's stone, they said you could revive dead plants. I mean, they really got into it. You could create fle flexible glass. It could uh, <coughs> rejuvenate uh, people who, uh, from fatigue. And, and one Greek philosopher said, if we had such a stone, people could become immortal. <laughs> and I uh, read that, that um, uh, Islamic philosophers hundreds of years ago. They also said that such a philosopher's stone could um, transform uh, base metals into into gold. Like that, the boy that you know got the stone from Sanatan Goswami originally. He was running around Vrindavan, touching everything, turning it to gold. <laughs> the Brajabhasis weren't impressed, so he went back, you know, asked Sanatan Goswami, "Is this really something valuable?" He said, "No." Chant this mantra, Hare Krishna. So people have this idea that this particular stone can turn things to gold. And it actually did, in the case with the young, young Brahmana boy and Sanatana Goswami. But the, um, the Islamic philosophers, they said that um, this change of, of being able to change with this philosopher's stone something into uh, gold, um, they called this uh, substance, this, this particular stone, they, they had a name for it, um, al-iksir, al-iksir in Arabic. And, and I was told that from that word comes the word elixir. <laughs> and they described this substance, this stone, it could, it could be in the form of a hard object or a powder. Now when it was in the form, when this philosopher's stone was in the form of a powder, um, it, it, it was, it was um, soluble and produced amazing results in its soluble form. Yet this particular powder, um, it couldn't be burnt by fire. And we're getting off track here a little bit, but just talking about this idea of these um, philosopher's stones. So, um, both the boy who was with Sanatana Goswami, he realized doesn't compare to Krishna consciousness. So he threw it in Kushim Sharovara. And our Babaji, he threw it into the Jamuna. So some good lessons from that particular um, Babaji, who, um, because of his um, presence, gave the um, first village the name Tilak Gadi, by training up everyone in the practices of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. And who taught, who showed us, who re the the futility of material wealth, by taking a st this stone which could turn material things into something like throwing it into the Jamuna River. We thank him. We have to thank all these previous saints for the philosophy and for the examples they set for us. Of course, for many people, it's hard to believe that anyone could throw away such wealth. Not for the Brajabhasis or those aspiring to be like them, as us. It's understandable because we're beginning to experience that the pure gem of eternal service to the Lord is infinitely more valuable and beneficial and pleasing than a Chintamani stone. Because we have tasted, even at this point, the nectar that comes from chanting Krishna's sweet holy names. And this is nicely expressed by Srila Rupa Goswami, again, in two of my favorite verses from his Padyavali. And we'll finish today with these two verses. 
which show um, how a devotee has no attraction to the things of this world because of that param drishta nivartante, that higher taste a devotee gets through practicing devotional service to the Lord, in particular, chanting Krishna's sweet names. Nama Chintamani Krishna, Chaitanya Rasha Vigraha. There's no difference between Krishna, who's all attractive, and his holy name. So let's finish. <laughs> We're finished with these two ah, such beautiful verses from Rupa Goswami. <clears throat> the first one is from, uh, it's text 56 in Padyavali, and the second one is text 23. O Lord, your devotee sees the king of rivers as a handful of water, the sun a firefly, Mount Meru, a clump of earth, the emperor of the world, a mere servant, a multitude of chintamani jewels as simply pebbles, a valuable desire tree, a mere stick, the entire world, a bunch of straw, and his own body, what? A burden only. And the final verse today, putting everything into proper perspective. If the opulence or knowledge of many millions of universes were clustered together, they would hardly equal a small fragment of the glory of Sri Krishna's holy name. Krishna's holy name is my life. It is the goal of my life. It is the means I will employ to attain the goal of my life. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. So nice to wander again in um, some special forest today. And uh, we'll continue um, our wandering as Prabhupada authorized us to do and as our beloved Lord Krishna also wanders throughout Vrindavan. I'll be back uh, in a couple of days to go through the books. <laughs> and find some more um, forests or such holy places like today. I thank you. We'll see you soon. Shri Shri Gaurani Thai Ki Shri Shri Krishna Balaram Ki Shri Shri Radha Shama Sundar Ki Vrindavan Eshwari Shri Mati Radharani Ki Shri Rabhavu Pada Ki Goka Vrindavan Dhamma Ki Shri Shri Gaurani Thai Ki Gaurani Premanandi Jai Jai Sri Sri Radhe Shime, shime, shime. Alright, well, see you soon. Vrindavan Dam Key.